We move on to questions to the Minister of Justice. Again, we will start with topical questions. And can I advise members that question number nine has been withdrawn? And I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister specifically in relation to prisoners who are sentenced for terrorist offences and where part of their sentence involves them being subject to licence in the community? Who actually provides the supervision? I'm not asking who notionally provides it, who on paper provides it, who actually provides it, the supervision in the community. Deputy Speaker, I am somewhat baffled in that that question does seem remarkably similar to one which has been withdrawn uh, from the main question list for written answer. But, uh, uh, as, uh, I, order, order. I assume, it, I assume it is in order for the member to, uh, to trump himself by, uh, by asking the question as a topical, in which case the answer is that where licence conditions are imposed on persons released from prison, they are monitored by the probation board with support where appropriate from the police, the prison service and my department. Individuals released on licence are subject to a combination of standard conditions set out in legislation and, where relevant, additional conditions. The aim of these conditions is to reduce the risk of harm to the public, reduce reoffending, and support the resettlement of the offender. A licence may be revoked and the offender recalled to custody where it is considered the risk of harm posed by an individual can no longer be safely managed within the community. Before I call Jim for supplementary, could I could ask members to uh, be respectful in the chamber and to listen carefully to the minister's response. I call Jim Allister. Could I suggest to the minister the answer he has given us is the answer as to what is supposed to happen, what on paper happens. But the reality on the ground is very different because the probation service refused to monitor terrorist prisoners. And is it not the case? that there are many terrorist prisoners supposedly on licence in the community who are never monitored because of that refusal by probation services. And is he trying to cover that up? Um, certainly, Deputy Speaker, I don't make a habit of covering things up. I think my record of coming to this House on a number of occasions when things have been somewhat difficult for the Department of Justice proves otherwise. I have given him a statement as to how regulations uh, provide and how the operational uh, uh, guidance between probation board, prison service, police and my department has operated since 2011. If he has specific examples where he believes that that is not being carried out, I have no doubt he will write to me. I call Anna Lu. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In June, the Minister undertook to write to the Finance Minister uh, about the issue of the Northern Ireland Civil Service Equal Pay Settlement. Uh, will the Minister update the Assembly on that correspondence, please? Yes, Deputy Speaker, I did indeed write to the then Finance Minister in June. Uh, it's been part of an ongoing uh, series of correspondence. That, um, I'm sure members would not wish me to bore them with the full detail of it. Uh, but certainly I welcome the fact that the new Finance Minister uh, adopted a position at question time in this assembly, I think a fortnight ago today, uh, in which he, uh, he gave a clear indication of his willingness to look again at the equal pay issue. I certainly am very keen to see the equal pay issue resolved, but the reality is that the resolution is not within my powers as Minister of Justice. If it is possible to get a solution on a cross-executive basis, I will be very pleased. I call Anna Lu. I thank the Minister. Um, certainly, I, w I welcome the, the Finance Minister's commitment as well. Um, is it fair then, Minister, uh, uh, to, if I can ask the Minister, is it fair uh, to say then the Justice Minister uh, will fully support a cross uh, departmental, cross party? Um, cross-party approach, um, as this says very clearly, a cross-departmental, cross-party uh, issue. And if central funding uh, can be found, that the Minister will fully uh, support it. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, that is exactly the case indeed. Sorry, I've just checked it. It was a fortnight ago yesterday the Finance Minister uh, made his point at question time in the Assembly. I wrote to him the following day, making it absolutely clear that I welcomed his intention to carefully consider the matter in the answer he gave that day and outlined why it was not possible for me to take the matter forward, but my willingness to participate in any discussions he wished to have. I call Tom Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware of the recent controversy surrounding the sexual exploitation of children. Can the Minister confirm that in the absence of the National Crime Agency operating in this field in Northern Ireland, that we will be left more exposed to this form of criminal activity than other parts of the UK? Well, Deputy Speaker, yes, it is indeed a concern of mine that when the National Crime Agency goes live on the 7th of October, if Northern Ireland is not part of the arrangements, and indeed clearly Northern Ireland cannot now be part of the arrangements from the 7th of October, that there will be something of a gap in our procedures. I'm certainly well aware of the Chief Constable's statement that he uh, will seek to ensure that the PSNI does its best to deal with the issue of child exploitation, but the reality is the specialist expertise for the United Kingdom exists within SEOP at the moment, which is becoming part of the NCA, which in the absence of agreement in this House will not be able to operate in the devolved sphere in Northern Ireland. I call Tom Buchanan. Thank the Minister for his response. But while the opposition of, of some in relation to the National Crime Agency is dressed up as concerns around accountability, is it not the case that there is good reason to believe that, for some, this is more about protecting their erstwhile friends who are involved in smuggling across the border? Well, Deputy Speaker, I have no knowledge as to what may motivate uh, any member of this House in the, in the direction suggested by Mr Buchanan. What I am absolutely clear about is that there will be significant benefits from Northern Ireland if the NCA were able to operate in the devolved sphere, subject to appropriate accountability arrangements, which I believe I have got in discussion with the Home Office. It is an issue which has to be considered in this Assembly as we look at serious issues like child exploitation, human trafficking and a range of other crimes which come within our domestic legislation and therefore which will not be amenable to full NCA support in the, in, in the arrangements under which the NCA will be operating from the 7th of October. The devolved sphere will be left out whilst accepted matters will be covered by the NCA. I call Trevor Clark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I note, Minister, you say you don't hide from uh, any of your responsibility. However, I table the question in relation to the numbers of prison staff within the prisons, particularly in McGilligan Prison, after a visit with the committee. Can the Minister put in record whether he's satisfied that the numbers in the prisons, in terms of the prison officers, is sufficient at the current time? Well, Deputy Speaker, I, th I think that Mr Clark will shortly receive the answer to his written question on that, but certainly I am satisfied by the prison service that there are adequate numbers of staff on duty in all three prison institutions at all times. I call Trevor Clark. Uh, th thank you for that answer. Uh, given that we have a representation from the prisoner officers on the day of our visit, has the Minister spoken directly to any of the prison officers in McGilligan, where we have situations where on one wing there are 50 prisoners and one, uh, one member of staff to look after 50 prisoners at night time? Well, Deputy Speaker, I am not aware that that is the position in McGilligan. It is not the way it has been presented to me. But I think we also have to be realistic about recognising that when risk assessments are done around uh, the way staff are deployed, sometimes it will be entirely possible that the prisoner to staff ratio is higher in some units than in others. The reality is the vast majority of our prisoners are not in that sense dangerous. And what we need to do is ensure that we get an appropriate staffing level for the different sorts of prisoners in the different parts of the prison estate so we maximize the use of resources and we do not have unnecessary numbers of uh, prison officers in some places that do not require it at the expense of other areas where a higher staff to prisoner ratio would be appropriate. I call David Hildage. Minister, over a period of time, the PSNI has developed the policy of reducing hours of local stations and getting officers out from behind desks. Uh, a clear community benefit was outlined. Can I ask the Minister what his assessment of the current policy is? Well, Deputy Speaker, that is very much an operational issue for the Chief Constable as to how he deploys his staff, but certainly overall. 
the fact that there are now something in the region of 600 or so officers available for frontline duties rather than performing desk jobs must surely be seen as a positive for all of us. I call David Hildage. Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank you, and I thank the Minister for outlining his, his answer and indeed the fact that it is operational. But, but could he assess uh, maybe some local policies in relation to the PSNI, particularly where there's high levels of criminal uh, activity and there appears to be no action? Well, no, Deputy Speaker, the answer is I can't assess those kind of operational issues uh, by uh, the, the Chief Constable. They are matters which are properly his. The oversight of the Chief Constable is primarily given by the Policing Board. There are arrangements, if he's talking about specific local issues, by which PCSPs can raise matters with their local police commander, but it is very much not the job of the Minister to interfere in those kind of operational decisions. I call Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister to outline the work he's currently taking forward in his department to support the armed forces community? I'm not aware if the member has any specific suggestions as to, as to what they should be. Perhaps a supplementary will tease them out. But the reality is the Department of Justice fulfills all its obligations to citizens in general, including the armed forces community. Given uh, the dependence that the justice system has on certain small elements of the armed forces in terms of things like the work of the ATOs and bomb disposal uh, and uh, especially search capabilities, uh, we fully recognise the benefits which come to Northern Ireland from the work of the armed forces and the need to ensure that we live up to our responsibilities for members of the armed forces. I call Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer and my supplementary will clarify. But the recent inquiry on the implementation of the Armed Forces Covenant conducted by the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee stated, we recommend that Her Majesty's Government investigates the specific circumstances of veterans coming before the criminal justice system and considers how their cases can be dealt with. Will the Minister commit to supporting any investigation by the Government on such an issue? Certainly, Deputy Speaker, if uh, the Government takes up that suggestion from the Select Committee, I can absolutely guarantee that my Department will cooperate in any work which is to be done from it. But as he highlights in the question, it is an issue for the Northern Ireland Office to consider whether they wish to take up that suggestion from the Select Committee. It will be up to the DOJ and indeed whatever other local departments may be responsible uh, for taking forward that work in consultation with the NIO, not in advance of the NIO. I call Mervyn Storey. Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister what discussions or correspondence he's had with the Minister for Education in relation to the inquiry into sexual exploitation of young people, given the serious nature? Uh, of the allegations that have come out into the public domain over the last number of weeks? Deputy Speaker, I have not had any discussions with the Minister of Education on those matters. As I think is fairly well known, uh, I had a joint meeting with the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety and our two committees last week. Uh, that is the primary issue because the child protection issue is primarily one for social workers. Uh, there is clearly a role for the police in support and indeed an ACC attended that joint meeting. Uh, if there are specific issues which the Chair of the Education Committee thinks I should be discussing with the Minister of Education, I will happily do so. I call Mervyn Story. I thank the Minister for his comments, but was it not the case that the Chief Constable uh, is on record as having made reference to the fact that education should be involved? And given clearly that there is a correlation between justice, health and education, uh, is not it now time for the Minister to enact a process whereby the Department of Education and all its various influences in relation to ensuring that our young people are protected and we are satisfied that everything is being done to ensure that young people and children are not being further exploited without us taking intervention to, pre to prevent it? Well, Deputy Speaker, I certainly agree with Mr Storey that we need to do all we can to protect children from sexual exploitation. Uh, there are discussions ongoing at the moment between my department and DHSSPS about the possible issues which may be followed up as we look at uh, the best possible way of providing that protection, because there are clearly issues which, uh, because they fall to both social workers and police in different ways, have relevance. I'm quite happy to look to see what the best possible way of doing that is. The Chief Constable has already committed to a peer review 
of the way that the policing uh, operation has been carried forward, and I know he indicated to the Justice Committee last week his willingness to look at the possibility of a joint examination to ensure that we have the best possible arrangements for child protection in the future. If that joint work also involves the Department of Education, then there may well be additional benefits, but they are primarily not the key department. The key issue is the work being done by social workers within the Health and Social Care Trusts and the role that the police have when criminal investigations are being carried out. And that is the end of our period of topical questions, and we now move on to oral questions.